how were you able to get into Syria? We got tourist visas. We were really lucky. Mm. Lots of journalists have been turned down, and we got really lucky. You captured a lot on video, and it's really extraordinary because, I mean, really the only images we've been able to get out of Syria are the cell phone camera images which protesters have been taking. You were actually in a house, uh, and nearby, nearby houses were being raided by militia. I, I want to play some of that. We hid our camera, but used a cell phone to film. I could hear the screams from next door as the militia raided the house. A mother was pleading with them not to take her son. I mean, it really gives you a sense of the fear that people live in every day. What is it, what is it like for dissidents there? What is it like for the protesters? They live as fugitives. They live on the run. Many of them haven't seen their families for months and months and they live going from safe house to safe house on the run. You know, the, the Syrian regime, which has been lying about an awful lot and, and lying for months, you know, they say these are terrorists, that these are uh, armed groups. Yeah, well, that's rubbish. Um, we didn't meet any terrorists. None of the protesters we met were armed. We saw thousands protesting. Men, women, and children. These are ordinary people. So the guys that we were with in the safe house, two of them were college graduates. We've heard a lot of stories from people I've talked to on this program, uh, dissidents, protesters, who say if you go to a hospital, the government will come to a hospital and, and remove people from the hospitals and, and, and disappear them or take them to a military hospital. D did you see evidence of that? We heard this time and time again. And we spoke to a doctor who said he'd seen with his own eyes injured protesters dragged out of their Three hospital times. beds by security forces. And he said some of them would come in with superficial injuries. And weeks later, their bodies, their dead bodies, would be returned to their mm. families. That's the other thing about this regime which I find so stunning is their, their willingness to torture people and kill people and then return the bodies to the families almost as a warning. But not only is the regime returning tortured bodies to families, it's doing it in a really disrespectful way. It's not adhering to the Muslim custom of returning the body immediately for burial. It's waiting one or two weeks. Mm. The, um, you were also able to speak to some dissident soldiers who had apparently uh, defected, and, and, and you were able to, to hear their perspective. I want to play some of that. <laughs> Basically saying that if they didn't shoot, that there were regime uh, supporters behind them who would actually shoot the soldiers. Do you, I mean, does evidence bear that out? This is a story that we kept on hearing, and it's been quite well documented by the activists as well. Mm. It's, n we didn't doubt it for a minute. It, it really amazes me just the, I mean, I guess it shouldn't amaze me, but just the, the extent to which the regime lies. You know, we had the Syrian ambassador to the UN on this program. And I mean, the stuff that was coming out of his mouth was, it, it would be funny if it wasn't so deadly serious. And it, it must have been interesting for you to hear what the regime is saying, but actually to see with your own eyes. Yeah, it's outrageous. And in fact, it's funny because when we flew into Damascus, we started to question whether this uprising was happening because life goes on as normal. And of course, the minute we left Damascus, it's everywhere. Mm. It's totally undeniable. And they are lying, lie upon lie. And of course, the day after Assad made this agreement with the Arab League to withdraw troops from all the cities, over 10 people were killed in homes. In fact, I was talking to one of the activists today, and I dread my conversations with them because I know they're going to, they're going to email over images of the, the, their latest friends dead. And yet, even though they're living in fear, and even though they are at risk of their own lives, and their friends are dying, and they could very well end up being dead, they're going to continue, you think? They will absolutely continue, and I think it's going to take a bloody turn now. One thing that they have said to me is that they're going to try and arm themselves. They think that's the only way of protecting themselves, of defending themselves.